Well, today we are starting a brand new series called Anchored, and today we get to launch it. The the whole idea behind the series is pretty simple, and I'll illustrate it like this. If you've ever been on a roller coaster ride, and it was one of those tricky ones where it seems like the track just drops out in front of you, there's that moment where you reach out your hands or you reach out to the, to the bar in front of you or to the leg of the person beside you and you hold on to whatever you feel like you need to hold on to because you think this roller coaster is going down. You, you immediately try to anchor yourself to something secure. And that's exactly what normal people do in every part of life. It's not just roller coasters, but when there's so many uncertainties that might come up into life, The the thing we instinctively do is we try to anchor ourselves to something. And what we're doing in this series is we're looking at how God actually provides those anchor points for us. Now, to be more specific, uh, the three weeks that we're spending in this series is really focused on your spiritual health. So what I hope to do by the end of today is I want to help you be spiritually woke and in tune with all the energy, spiritual energy within you and around you and how to to connect with that. I'm kidding, I can't do that. Um, We're not, it's not that kind of a spiritual thing, like there's this mystical energy around you. Maybe there is, maybe there isn't, but I haven't figured that out yet. Simply, when we talk about spiritual health, we're just talking about your beliefs. It's a little bit easier than, you know, spiritual energy floating around you. We're just talking about the beliefs that are inside of you. And the more you understand your beliefs, the more spiritually healthy you can be. In fact, I would put it this way. A person is spiritually healthy when they firmly are believing in something that's worth believing in. And that means there's two parts to it. Number one, you are firmly latched on. You are firmly anchored to something. But the other part is it has to be something worth firmly believing in. And sometimes we get one of those two things mixed up. Either you're not firmly believing in something or the thing you're believing in, the thing you're anchored to, is not worth holding on to. In the whole context of spiritual health, as we're going to uncover in this series, we're going to be challenging you to think about how spiritually healthy you are. And this is something that's, that's hard to put our minds around and think about because it's not something concrete. Like we can measure how much you weigh, we can measure how much you can exercise, and we can measure calories. Like we can talk about physical health real easily, but how do you measure or gauge your spiritual health? If you were to walk into my office and stay six feet apart with a mask on, or if it may be easier, if you were just to call me up this week and say, Pastor Matt, could you help me evaluate my spiritual health? Like how am I doing? I would ask you two questions. The first question I would ask you to evaluate your spiritual health is, who do you believe God is? Who is God to you? And I don't want to hear you recite the Apostles' Creed back to me, and I don't want to hear the memorized answers that you learned as, as, as an eighth grader. What I want to hear from you is who you believe God is. Is he good? Is he there? Has he been working for your good? Has he been fair to you? Is he loving? Does he love you? Who is God? And as you think through those answers, there comes perhaps an even more important question that comes right after it. Not just who do you believe God is, but what do you believe God thinks about you? As God thinks about you, what's his view of you? Is he pleased with you or not? Does he love you or not? Have you done what he wants or not? Who is God? And what do you believe he thinks about you? Now, one of the things that I also acknowledge that when it comes to spiritual health is sometimes it can be difficult to measure things that we believe. Let me give you a quick example. Um, Over the last several years, I think all of us have our plans and goals, right? Like, to some degree, I don't know why it happens then, but on the eve of a January 1st, all of a sudden we get these ideas about habits and plans and things that we can change and resolutions we can make, right? And as we think about all those things, we come up with the best plan ever, right? I mean, if you want a path towards perfect, 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 perfect physical health, you, you can drop the perfect plan of nutrition and exercise and sleep. Sleep is important. And you can come up with a perfect plan But sometimes, quite often, we fail. Not because there's something wrong with the plan, but because there's something wrong with what we 
might believe. Let me put it this way. I might have the perfect plan for nutrition, but if I believe that at the end of a hard day's work, I owe it to myself to eat a gallon of ice cream and open a bag of chips, if I believe that, my belief will outweigh my, my plan. What I believe in my heart will contradict what I know in my mind. And with resolutions, there's so many elements to it. There's, you have to have a good plan. You have to have accountability. But I, I think for a lot of us, the things that we've been frustrated with because we can't just make any progress, it isn't because we don't know what to do. It's because we're believing something that's holding us down. And the big thing I want to start with is that sometimes we're not even aware of what we believe. I, I was uh, working through some nutrition and physical goals <laughs> for 40 years now. <laughs> I'm 40 years old. I've been working through physical and nutrition goals for 40 years now. And it wasn't until later, late this last year that I realized that I was believing something that was contradicting what I wanted to do. I wanted to clean up nutrition. I wanted to make physical exercise a regular thing. But what I believed was contradicting that. Um, I, what I believed was that I wanted to be physically healthy so that people would admire me. And once I was physically healthy, then I would be where I wanted to be. But that never works. You, you, if I'm anchored to that, it's not going to happen. Um, another thing that I've been aware of, and I've shared this before, but with my personality and also I think with my calling, I tend to be more of a people pleaser. Like, I believe that I am valuable if people like me. And that's what I believe. And what I've began to realize is that the things you believe, whatever you believe in, you are anchored to. Regardless of what kind of plan you come up with, the things you believe in, you will be anchored to. And sometimes we don't even know the things that we believe on the inside. Sometimes it takes someone from the outside to ask you the question, why are you doing that? And you say, I don't know, I don't wanna do it. The answer you're doing it is because Deep down inside, you're believing something that you might not even be aware of. And this is dangerous territory to get into on a stage because there's no way that individually for each one of you, everyone listening online, that I can possibly go through all the different routes of things we tend to believe that aren't very good to anchor our lives to. But thankfully, what we're going to see in this series is that God doesn't just leave us to figure this out on our own. He actually promises three different ways that he intersects with our souls, our spirits, not just our minds, not just our emotions, but our very seat of belief. He enters into that space to give us insight into what we believe and when needed to replace it with something better. Your spiritual health is all about how, what you believe about God and what you believe God thinks of you. Sometimes we don't even know what we believe, but God promises to meet us in that space to help us understand and replace. As you look at the Bible, not only is it an intellectual pursuit where it teaches you theological truths about God and how he does things, that's one part of the Bible, but there's also a promise in the Bible that as you read through its words, God uses those words to enter into your soul, into your spirit, to search out the things you believe and replace them if needed. In, the, in uh, Lutheran circles, we often refer to this as the means of grace. It's the means by which God enters into you personally. He promises that he will use this tool to enter into your heart, to search out your beliefs, to cast light on the things you weren't even aware of, to show you that maybe the things you're firmly believing in are not worth believing in and then to replace them with something else. Because what we all know is that what you believe in, you are anchored to. No matter how good your plans or intentions may be, whatever you believe in, you are anchored to. So throughout this series, we're gonna look at the three ways God specifically promises to enter into your hearts, to expose and, and shed light on the things we believe, not to judge us, not to show us how foolish we are, but to replace it with something better. Because what often happens is you're not ready to let go of what you're anchored to until there's something better to hold on to. And that's what I want to show you today. One day, Jesus was in front of some people who were anchored to the wrong thing. And so in love, in grace, he approached them and confronted them and showed them and us what it means 
to be spiritually healthy. And maybe you're in a place where you're like, ah, there's too much. I don't want to dig into this. Well, let me just put it this way. What if the belief that you're looking for is something that God gives? I believe it is. And as we see today, it's simple, simple time in the right place that gives you the truth you need to be anchored to the most. We're going to look at a section from John chapter 8 where Jesus was interacting with some Jews. What had just happened was he was trying to tell them who he was. <laughs> There's a group of people, and Jesus was very clear, like, I am the Son of God. The Father and I, we work together. He testifies to who I am. The miracles I do, they prove who I am. And the people were like, no, who are you? They weren't having it. And so since they couldn't understand with their mind where Jesus was going, Jesus says, okay, well, we have to talk about what you're anchored to in your heart. You have a belief you're anchored to that won't allow you to see the truth that I'm sharing with you. Sometimes you have to cut loose the lie before you can receive and see what's true. And so as Jesus was talking through him, finally some of the Jews began to kind of get like, okay, we, we, we understand what you're saying. And in that moment, Jesus looks at them and he says this. So to the Jews who were believing in Jesus, Jesus said, if you hold to my teaching, if you are anchored onto my truth, then you are really my disciples. If you abandon whatever other truths that you were anchored to and holding on to firmly, if you let those go, if you cut loose the lies, and if you hold to my teaching, apply it to your life, then you are really my disciples disciples. And then <laughs> Jesus said something that insulted them. He said something that got to the heart of their beliefs and uncovered that hidden thing that maybe they didn't even know about, but they were about to admit with their very own mouths. If you hold to my teaching, you are really my disciples, and then you will know the truth, and the truth that I offer you will set you free. To us, this sounds like an amazing truth. Like, we could just soak this in and, and live it. But to the people who've heard this, to the Jews who heard this, they were greatly offended. Um, quick history lesson. They, they believed that since they were Jews, that God loved them and, and favored them. A Jew was someone who was simply a descendant of Abraham. And God had given Abraham this great promise that he would make Abraham into a great nation and the, the Jews in Jesus' day were still waiting for that to happen. They were looking for a, a, a country to form. But Jesus was challenging them that their belief in a great country was at odds with God's promise of a great kingdom. And until they let go of the lie, cut loose the lie, Jesus could not offer them the truth that he really had to offer. And so as these Jews thought about it, they were greatly offended that Jesus would say that they would be set free. How could you say that we would be set free? We're descendants of Abraham. In fact, they, they actually say this. They said, we are Abraham's descendants. We are sons of the kings of Israel. <laughs> and we have never been slaves of anyone, which is a lie if you look back at Egypt and Babylon and Assyria <laughs> and all the countries that overtook them. It was Maybe they had selective memory, but they said that we've never been slaves of anyone. How can you say that we shall be set free? Now, here's where you and I just need to, to pause and apply this truth to ourselves because they couldn't even see the fallacy in what they were believing. They, they weren't willing to cut loose the lies of what they were anchored to because they couldn't see the truth of what Jesus was sharing. And sometimes it is so true of me, and maybe for you too, but it's a scary thing to cut yourself loose from something that you've been holding on to. Um, so one, one thing that I've shared in a previous series and several times is that part of my personality, but I think it's also part of my calling as a pastor, it's uh, led me to a place where I'm really consumed by wanting to please all the people around me. I wanna make everyone happy with me, and if someone isn't happy with me, it just destroys my world. So here's what that means I'm believing. What I'm believing is that my value, I believe my value is determined by people liking me. I was anchored to that, and I still have to fight that. And I don't want to let go of that unless there's something better. You see, when it comes to the things you wrestle with, 
the things that set you off into an emotional tailspin or the things that make you want to binge, eat whatever you like to eat or drink whatever you like to drink, usually there's an underwriting belief at the heart of it. And what we need to acknowledge before God, before ourselves, and just be honest with is that some things we're anchored to are just not true. They're not worth holding on to. There is something better that God himself offers. What have you been holding on to? What have you been anchored to that's been keeping you from where God wants you to be? Would you just acknowledge it's possible that the things you believe in might not be true? It is impossible to please all the people around you. You'll never do that because people are evil. (laughs) People are sinful. I won't please them. And even if I do everything I can, some people just won't be pleased. But that's not who I am. I, I believe that my value is not determined by what people think about me. I believe that my value was determined on a cross 2,000 years ago, and I believe that I am worth what someone is willing to pay for me. I believe that I was bought at a price and that I am not my own. That changes how I interact with people. But first, you have to acknowledge that some of the things you're anchored to are just not true. And in order to bridge that gap, to hold on to what's better and cut loose the lies that were holding you down, we need divine intervention. And that's exactly what Jesus gets into next. As he's talking to these Jews who just can't get what kind of freedom he's giving, Jesus spells it out for for us and for them. Jesus replied very truly. In other words, come in. What you're about to hear is life-changing. This isn't some wisdom from philosophy. This is divine truth from God. Very truly, I tell you, everyone who sins is a slave to sin. This is why we always find ourselves believing in things that are just not true, anchoring ourselves to things that aren't true. And this is why we continually come up with this negative self-talk. I'm just no good. I'm just a failure. This world would be better off without me. We are slaves anchored to the things that hold us from where we want to be and definitely things that hold us from where God wants us to be. Whoever sins, and that's all of us, is a slave to sin. You have no power to change that. No matter how hard you pull that anchor up, it will just pull you down. So Jesus said, here's what's needed. Now, a slave has no permanent place in the family, but a son, if you're the son, that changes things. The son belongs to it forever. The son has decision-making authority. The son has the inheritance that he can decide what to do with. So if the son sets you free, you will be free indeed. What Jesus pointed to here is this moment where he's inviting them, he's inviting you, that as you think about your own spiritual health and how you've been firmly holding on to things, maybe some of the wrong things, that you would acknowledge, yes, some of those things are untrue. But if not that, then what do I have to hold on to? And Jesus said, let me handle that. Let me just set you free. The thing that's been holding you down, would you just cut loose the lie? Would you cut it loose? And would you follow me? The sun will set you free. I'm going to go back to a passage earlier in John where John is just introducing who Jesus is. You know, Jesus, the son of God who came from eternity to be with us, he didn't come full of anger and judgment, but this is how John describes him in chapter one. When Jesus came, when the son came, it says the law was given through Moses. The commandments, like how stupid we are, how foolish we are, how sinful we are, how enslaved we are to sin, how we can't break free from it, Moses drove that home through the commandments. But grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. The opposite of truth is false. Jesus came full of truth. Not the truth that points to you and says you messed up. The truth that says here is something you can anchor your life to. Full of truth that gives us hope, but full of grace to call us from whatever we were believing in, whatever we were anchored to, and to say, here, the Son will set you free. The truth is that I came to be your Savior. For a moment, as Jesus was on that cross, dying 
for, for things he didn't do. It was as if he was becoming the one who was anchored by sin, one who had no power over it. it it's as if he became what we were, so that in the end he could relieve us from what we had no power over. Whoever sins is a slave to sin, but if the Son comes and sets us free, we are free indeed. Would you trust him in that? Would, would you take the things you've been believing in that you've been anchored to? And by the way, this isn't like a 30-minute a thing where you like, have sudden clarity about your life and all the things you believe in. This is a lifetime of analyzing the things you are believing and thinking about them and holding them up into the light of Jesus' truth and grace and saying, is this what my life should be anchored on? Is this truth? Or is this just keeping me from where God wants me to be? And as you look at what Jesus offers, you quickly see that what you had been holding onto is not worth holding onto. And as Jesus, as, as we go one more verse in John chapter eight, Jesus, as he uh, approaches the, uh, the Jews with one final word, this is gonna give us some closing application for us today too, as, as we think about our own spiritual health and how to navigate the things we've been believing in and what it means to let those go and hold on to what truth Jesus gives. Uh, he, he approaches the Jews and he says, I know who you are. I know that you're Abraham's descendants. To which he could look at me and he, he could say, Matt, I know you love to please people. I know you like to make people happy. That's not a bad thing, but that's not your anchor. I know that you're Abraham's descendants. It's not a bad thing. It's, it's pretty cool that you can trace your ancestry back to Abraham. Yet, you're looking for a way to kill me because you have no room for my words. You're already anchored onto a truth that you're not going to let go of, and so you have no room for me. And that should prompt a question from, from me and from you. Do I have room? A am I making room? Am I, cutting, am I willing to cut loose the lies and instead hold on to the truth that Jesus has set before me, the truth that I'm a child of God, the truth that I am not my own, that I was bought at a price? Am I willing? Am I open to that? As, as we close here, I want to boil it down to one thing. When it comes to your spiritual health, you don't have to be super in tune with all the you know, spiritual energies. I don't, know, I don't know what that means. It's not about that. Spiritual health is simply about what you believe. And sometimes it takes time to figure out what you believe. A long time. It could take years. So as we close, I want to give you three simple things that spiritual health requires. In order to have it, you need to have grace and truth over time. Truth that contrasts itself with the lies that we tend to believe. Grace to approach you in those moments with forgiveness and healing and an invitation for something better. And then time. Time to let the wisdom of God, the strength of God, and the forgiveness of God call us from where we were to where we need to be. Understanding that our sins were forgiven by Jesus and he wants us to have hope that secures our life. So, means of grace, the means by which God enters into your spirit to shed light on the things you believe, to expose the lies that we might be believing in and to replace them with something infinitely better. The means of grace is simply the Bible. One way that God speaks truth into your life. You could spend all your time meditating and become a spiritual person, but ultimately spiritual health comes not by th listening to your inner voice, but by listening to God's voice spoken over you. And whatever it takes for you to overwhelm the lies within, the voices within, let God speak into your heart through his words. Uh, when Jesus was teaching people, he pointed to the Old Testament scriptures and he said, these are the scriptures that testify about me, the grace, the truth, the life. And when Jesus was sending out his apostles who wrote the New Testament, he said, don't worry about what you say. It'll be my words that are spoken through you. And so throughout the New Testament, we see their testimony. So you see where I'm getting at. The Bible, it's, it's not just some mystical book. It's simply the testimony that Jesus gave us to navigate what is truth and what is the grace that we need to apply it. So your, your uh, assignment this week 
evaluate how much time you're spending listening. How much time are you giving to grace and truth in your daily life? And if you already have a solid Bible reading plan and a prayer plan, awesome, keep it up. If, if that's something that you're not doing yet, I've got a deal for you. Um, starting tomorrow, starting this week, we are going to be doing another all-church Bible reading plan, and the idea is we will encourage one another to be anchored to the truth of what God declares so that when it comes to the way you interact with people or the way you choose your health, whatever it is, it's not based on lies that you're anchored to, but it's based on the grace and the truth that God declares over you. And here's the blessing at the end of it. This is from Hebrews chapter, chapter six, where it talks about the blessing of having this firm, sure word that's spoken into your life, something you can depend on. Hebrews six simply puts it this way. We have this hope as an anchor for the soul. It doesn't just shape your plans. That's a mental exercise. It doesn't just influence your emotions. That's how you react to events. It changes your heart. It influences what you believe so that you have something worth anchoring your life on. So who is God? And who do you believe? uh, What do you believe about what he thinks about you? As you navigate those two key questions that determine your spiritual health, The only way to come to a proper answer is to see what God himself declares. He is your savior. He is your father. He is your comforter. He is your counselor. And he has declared that you are his child because of what Jesus did. And the more you anchor your life on that truth, the more you will see God working in you what he wants to do. Let's pray. Dear Father in heaven, The gift of your word, as we see in the scriptures, is such an amazing gift. Not because we believe it's some magical thing that uh, does things, but it's your simple words that can speak truth and grace into our life. I know sometimes this isn't help. This isn't uh, something that makes us very happy. It can make us very uncomfortable, in the sense that when we start digging around in our beliefs, it makes us question maybe who we are and what we're doing. But With you, there's not just truth, but with you, there's also the grace to approach us with forgiveness and love and kindness. You're not demanding something from us. You're inviting us to a better life where we're closer to you and where we put all of our faith and confidence in what you declare. So renew in us today and this week a a desire to dig into your words so that we can see what you declare, so that you can shed light on the, the, the things that we believe and so that you can realign our anchor to the best place it could be firmly in what you have declared. I pray all these things in Jesus' name.